here. Great, thanks. Okay, we're about ready to start. I think we have to give people three more minutes. I take it everything went well with uh, the Breathless? It, was any class driving you out or did you, was it all perfectly peaceful? That's, that's good. For anybody who wants to see Breathless again, there, I'm gonna, I'll put the DVD, I'll put the DVD on reserve in the Howison Library first thing tomorrow morning. And, and if you want to tonight, if anybody wants it tonight, you, if you want to watch it tonight, you can come back with me and get the DVD out of, with, it's in my office. I, I, the, did you like it? I presume you ought to like it. It's one of the most amazing movies ever. And uh, uh, it sort of breaks with all sorts of traditions and tries to reinvent movies. Let's see, is that, there was starting to be a feedback. Now it's okay. Okay, let's start. Um, so, I'm gonna jump right in because there's so much to say about this movie. If I don't finish today, of course I can go on next time. So don't, don't feel that you shouldn't interrupt and contribute your own perceptions of it as we go. No, I, I'm glad you told me. I mean, I can't cope with all these things and that would be very unfortunate. Well, it's doing funny things again, which, which I don't understand, but which last time it did them, I finally got it to stop doing them. Now it's fine. Okay, now, like usual, I like to begin with some kind of puzzle. I mean, maybe I choose movies for this. Remember in Hiroshima Mon Amour, it was what it was, do you remember anything or no, you don't remember anything. And it was, uh, well, never mind. Let's start with this. There's not enough time to go back. The, the puzzle in this one is, why does Michelle call Patricia de Gulas, which gets translated in some stupid way, as I recall in the subtitles. What, what does he say to her at the end? And what did they translate that as? What? Scumbag, right, that's just ridiculous. It's, it's either something like revolting or disgusting. I mean, it's not uh, totally wrong, but he, I think he says you're disgusting. And uh, the policeman interprets that as, uh, what is it, you're a little bitch, is that right, I think? The, he says, I guess, I guess that's all right. But the question is, why does he uh, say that to her? And well, tell me first, what's the obvious answer? Which is going to be wrong, but it's important to know what it is. Yeah, why, why would he be thinking she was disgusting? Has she done anything awful? Yeah. He says, uh, it's disgusting. That's good. That's why scumbag couldn't be the right translation. No, he says, say de gulas. It's disgusting. But it turns out that some, it's something she's done that's disgusting. I think everybody just agrees about that. Well, I, we'll have to go back. Whoever's watching the movie, you'd better go back and... and uh, you know French? If you watch the movie, will you be able to tell us what, what exactly they say? Because it, 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 I mean, it would complicate things if he, sa if he said it's disgusting because then you'd have to make a further interpreting move to see that it's her, but I'm pretty sure it is her. And the policemen, you can't trust them very much, but uh, say it's her. But, and, and there's every, I mean, the story I'm gonna tell you makes it clear that it's gotta be her. But uh, it would be nice if the movie was caught up with my interpretation on this point. Uh, so, uh, so, but anyway, what, what would be the obvious reason for telling her that she's disgusting? She ratted him out. She turned him in. Why, well, that's pretty disgusting, isn't it? But that's not the reason at all. I guarantee it. By the time we get there, you will agree with me that that, has, that is not the reason. That we got a long way to go. So let's start. start. We're going to start by talking about Michel Poicard. And all through this, I'm going to tell you when, it, when it's Nietzschean, but you'll see. But, I'm not, I mean, but first, we just got to pay attention to the movie. So the question is, why is Michel so attractive? After all, he's just a punk who kills a policeman, steals money from his ex-girlfriend in the most disgusting way when she tries to, you remember, tries to loan him the money. He uses that to find out where the money is. And then while she's putting on her dress, he steals the money, then offers to take her to breakfast with her money. And uh, he just, so he, uh, he shows, uh, the, this girlfriend trusts him, he betrays her, 
and uh, so forth. I mean, he is not, if you describe him objectively, and he spends plenty of time when he's not doing anything else looking at pin-up pictures in the, in the Gurley magazine. That's what you see first when you see him stealing a car. And of course he steals cars. Uh, I forgot to even put that on my list. So, uh, and yet, now here's already a controversial point. I don't know about you all. I think he's very attractive. I mean, I think the movie wouldn't work if he weren't very attractive. But when I said this the last time I taught the course, there was a general revolt, mostly from the women, that he wasn't attractive at all. Uh, you want to say something about this? I thought you said, I mean, I mean, he's, I mean, if he is attractive, I mean, do you think he's attractive? Yeah, I do too. I don't know what happened last time. I, I mean, he's, he's attractive he's, uh, physically and for his personality. He's an ex-boxer. This is the first movie. Godard just found him. And he, you know, he goes through this boxing routine every once in a while. And he looks great. Anyway, so, but that's what, what's attractive about, I think, is his style. That he does everything with flair, with cheerfulness. And with intensity, those ought to sound particular. With style, cheerfulness, and intensity, that ought to sound, that sounds Nietzschean. And you, when, and if you ask, what is it about Bogart that he's devoted to? Because remember, the one thing he looks at, as if, maybe, you couldn't even laugh at it. I don't know, that dish doesn't come up. But with a, with a kind of reverence, is the picture of Bogey. And what does Bogey have that he admires, presumably? I presume it's style. I presume that there's a bogey style, that he's got the same style in all his movies. It's a kind of cool that he's got. It's certainly not the principles he stands for or how, how he looks, I mean, in, in, in physically looks. So he's, he's got style, and I think he admires style. And he's also ready to live dangerously just to the end. Remember, I stressed that quote in uh, The Gay Science, what he says is, as, he, as he's driving the stolen car, never use the brake, and at a certain moment, a poster behind him on, uh, at the movie theater says, the poster in French reads, live dangerously until the end, uh, which is exactly what Nietzsche says. I believe that the movie the, the subtitles are completely different because the sub, they, you see the marquee of the movie theater and it's got some movie title on it. And you see the poster, which says live dangerously to the end. And the stupid people who are doing the subtitles translate what's on the marquee instead of what's on the poster. So you didn't see live dangerously just to, to the end, I don't believe. But it's certainly important because that's sort of the Nietzsche... Uh, stamp on the movie. I mean, if it, that's supposed to alert you to something that, that could have been any old poster. It was any old marquee, but it turns out that it's absolutely crucial. It's his way of life. And, but though he's intense, he's cool. That's the, the bogey side. It, he, that you can see in his contrast with the sweaty, panicky seriousness of the cops when they're following Patricia around, for instance, and he's following them around, he's, they're frantic and, and he's cool. They're, they're, and that just makes him look all the cooler. Now, there's another important thing about him, <clears throat> a passage which I intended to read last time, but didn't, because I didn't see my notes on it. He's, uh, he's also egotistical, Ego, egoism, meaning selfish. He takes whatever he wants. And he does whatever he desires. Now, and that, you might think, was not an attractive trait. But Nietzsche thinks it's an attractive trait. Now I'm on page 258 of The Gay Science, aphorism 328. Surely the faith preached so stubbornly and with so much conviction that egoism is reprehensible, has on the whole harmed egoism while benefiting, as I shall repeat a hundred times, the herd instincts. Above all, by depriving egoism of its good conscience. Now, he's got perfectly good conscience. It doesn't bother him that he's stealing the girl's money. It doesn't bother him that when he, whatever he wants from Patricia, he just says he wants it and insists and insists until he gets it. Um, and so it, it deprives of egoism of good conscience, and bids us to find in, and bids us to find in egoism the source of unhappiness. 
It, quote, your selfishness is the misfortune of your life. That was preached for thousands of years and harmed, as I have said, selfishness and deprived it of much spirit, much cheerfulness, much sensitivity, much beauty. So he's, he's, that's, egoism is just another good thing about him. I mean, he does everything for his own happiness, but he doesn't think about himself. He just spontaneously and instinctively goes after whatever he wants. Um, then it's important that he's got this kind of spontaneity. He never reflects, he doesn't think, he does on whatever his impulses tell him. What's the most funny impulsive thing he does? Do you remember? Who's my, like, my, what? Picking up the girl's skirt, right. He says, well, it'd be nice to pick up that girl's skirt. And she says, be my guest. And he runs out of the, stops the cab and runs out and does it. Well, that's a kind of cheerful, uh, peculiar, uh, impulsiveness that's very attractive about him. But the most important thing about him, not, is, not all those things, but for us anyway, reading it, I don't think it's something Patricia appreciates. I'm not sure that any of these traits are what she appreciates about him. We'll have to worry about that later. But what, what, what's interesting about him is he invents, keeps inventing and reinventing his life. If you ask yourself, who is Michel Poitard? What, what do we know about him? Well, we only know one thing, I think, that he was this, a steward uh, on, Air, uh, 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 a on Air France. That's his connection with that travel agency. And uh, he never mentions that he was, I think. The police, that's right, the police mention it. For him, this is a very boring identity, one that he doesn't even care about. And what other identities does he have? Well, uh, besides that, he, we find out and, and that's, well, let me just say that again. That's everyday reality. That's a boring job. And Nietzsche says he should be an outlaw. And in, in fact, he's an outlaw. And in this vacuum, of ha he invents himself a completely glamorous life. I mean, we don't know what his parents really did, presumably something boring. That he has a grandfather with a Rolls Royce who never opened the hood in 15 years. He had a time in the army where his job was to slit the throats of the sentries. He was an assistant movie director in Nice. He had a habit of staying at the Claridge Hotel, which is like the Ritz, and selling, he sold used cars in New York. And his father was a famous clarinetist. I mean, all those are possible lives and possible identities which he just invents in the space of the presumably completely boring life and completely boring family and background that he really has. And I'm just listing all these things. I've, so far I've said that he has style, that he's cool, that he's egoistic, spontaneous, invents his life. And the last one, irreverent. Uh, you remember, uh, you can laugh at anything. I, I think for the first time teaching it this time around, I don't know whether he can laugh at Bogart. I think not. I think that's somehow part of the kind of identity he's got. Uh, but everything else, remember the, there's a little irreverent thing which fits in perfectly with this. When the guy gets hit by a car and is lying there on the street and they looking and then they discover that he's really dead. And what does he do? He, what? Well, first he does one thing before he starts reading the newspaper. He crosses himself. I mean, that's, that's taking, that's the irreverence toward things that other people take seriously. Uh, that's in, in the gay sciences. I read this, but it so fits him that I'll read it again on page 347. Where it's at the end of aphorism 382, he, the, 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 this is the uh, um, free spirit, he confronts all earthly seriousness so far, all solemnity in gesture, word, tone, eye, morality, and task so far, as if they were, as if it, that him, were their most incarnate and involuntary parody. That's the, what he's up to. And she later talks about Romeo and Juliet, and he says, oh, that's a silly woman's idea. I mean, there are, insofar as anything comes up that's serious, he, uh, he's ready to parody it or poo-poo it. Um, 
Let's see what else. Uh, and of course, the weirdest thing in the movie for this, of, make, of not taking seriously something that people have normally taken seriously, is, uh, well, whatever it is, what's happening between them in that hotel room, that long, long scene, which is just surprise after surprise and absolutely unbanal. I mean, is that a seduction scene? I mean, well, the sex plays some kind of role in it, but it seems to be uh, all sort of like a joke where love and desire and passion and sex, none of them are taken seriously. It ends with them under the sheets and the radio saying, uh, now work to music. And then they just reach out and turn out the radio. But it's, there's never anything like a normal, serious uh, movie uh, or real life relation between them. And uh, that's fine. Uh, And one of the other ways you can see that he doesn't want us to take anything seriously is the funny faces he makes at her. That if he starts making them in the mirror at the other girl, the nice girlfriend's place where the movie begins, but he makes them for her too. His fail a girl in French, it means to make faces. And uh, it's sort of, it's, the, uh, it's not keeping a straight face, you could say. He doesn't keep a straight face about anything. It's the seriousness again. When, and uh, this making of this face, of course, comes back at the very end of the movie, where he again does those grimaces, those three grimaces. Um, okay, so that's the irreverent. Now, there's still more. So he seems also to be in the brief habit form of acting. When, uh, when, when the, she talks about Romeo and Juliet on 72, I put this on reserve. This is the scenario. You, some of you have it, I see. You, some of you don't because I, I said I recommended it. She at the bottom of 72 says, I wish I were Romeo. I wish we were Romeo and Juliet. And he says, oh, la, la, what a girlish idea. Um, and then they go on, which is interesting. You said, she says, you see, you said last night in the car you couldn't live without me, but you can. Uh, Romeo couldn't live without Juliet, but you can. You can. And he sort of uh, says, no, I can't live without you. And she says, oh, la, la, now that's just a boyish idea, and so forth. So they're making fun of unconditional commitment. And, but they are saying that for the time being, that he's saying, I can't, I mean, you are my brief habit, he's saying to her. Right now, I can't be happy with anybody else. Remember, he says, I don't, I think it's, it used to be translated. See, I've seen it in the different, with different subtitles. And I had to go to this meeting, so I didn't see this one. But it, does he say it doesn't click with anybody but her when he's talking to one of his uh, friends? I don't know what the French is for that. And I don't know what your translation of that. But right now, it's working with her. He's really happy to be with her. He's not happy to be with anybody else. Not even that very beautiful and lovely and hardworking girl that offers to loan him the money and, and seems to be uh, in love with him or at least one of his ex-girlfriends. No, none of that matters. But I take it he's not going to say he's got an unconditional commitment to her that she makes him, gives him his identity or anything like that. Uh, he can't do without her. But what... What it is about her that makes her so special for him. That, let's see, did I say, uh, you know, I, I've written here, why, did, why does it only click with her? Why can't he do without her? Well, he, he can do without her. I think that's a mistake. That's the point. She's complaining, and rightly, that he's not defining himself and his world in terms of her. He's not doing that with anybody. So, get rid of that. Okay, and finally, what to sum up all this, or no, it doesn't sum up all this, it's just another one, but it's related to all these. He has a positive interest in nothingness. That should be an important clue. He's not afraid of death. He says he's fascinated by it. He says he thinks about death constantly, and at one point he even pretends happily to be dead in Patricia's lap. And it just makes life more interesting. Death is close to him throughout the film, and it doesn't frighten him a bit, and it doesn't make life meaningless for him. It, it, it contrasts that with The Stranger, 
which you, a lot of you have read, you said, where Merceau's life becomes meaningless in the face of the cold wind by, uh, blowing from the future, that is, his death. Whereas, uh, until the very end of the book, where he understands, too, that death gives life a kind of poignancy, that Michel understands that all the time. And that's what, since everything is meaningless and nothing frightens him, he, and he's open to everything. He appreciates everything. And you get this funny list when he's driving the car at the beginning, and he says, he says uh, if you don't love the sun, and, and well, he, says, he just says, I love the sun, I forget how it goes, and France, and the streets, oh, oh, and, and France, and then he also says he loves the old neighborhoods when they're driving by that fancy new apartment building in by the Jardin du Luxembourg, and he, and he says, isn't, isn't it beautiful, the Place de la Concorde at night? All of these things. He's really open to appreciate them, but appreciate them just in a passing sort of way. He's open to them all equally. He doesn't make a big deal about any of them. He's very observant, by the way. Just This will sort of interest you if you see it again. He notices the man who recognizes him from the newspaper picture as he's sitting in the car in front of the Herald Tribune waiting for Patricia. Uh, it's an interesting one. I can make three points about that. One, he's observant and he sees it happen. That's not a big deal. Two, just for your information, that's Godard. Godard has put himself in the movie the way Hitchcock always put himself in his movies. Godard is the one who sees in the paper that this is really the guy they're looking for. But more important to us, since he's not afraid of death and he cares about Patricia right now, he doesn't, when he notices that he's been recognized and this guy's obviously going to go out and call the police, he doesn't leave. He's not going to leave because he's waiting for her. And that's what he happens to care about right then. So, so now we're going to sum up Michel's way of being. And that is, he's an active nihilist. In the breakdown of all values, uh, he's happily reinventing himself and reinventing worlds. And, uh, he, and this is so that the breakdown of everything is a source of joy for him. It's an occasion for him to be creative. Uh, if he had some famous father and grandfather, that would be bad news because then he couldn't invent all these other lives for himself. He'd have some important identity. But he takes this lack of any important identity as a great thing. He, it's a positive freedom to cheerfully invent and reinvent his life to get a, presumably a whole series of brief habits of which he's happily enjoying this one. Now, Godard talks about the movie on, in, in this. And what he says is sometimes very interesting. And it's very Nietzschean. Again, a clue, I think. He says, the genre of breathless was such that all was permitted. That was its nature. Sound familiar? Whatever people might do, all this could be integrated into the film. This was even my point of departure. I said to myself, we've had Hiroshima. A certain kind of cinema has ended. That was, that was a very serious, uh, coherent, uh, well-made movie. He says, uh, that's ended. Well then, I think, I said, let's put the final period to it. Let's show that anything goes. Uh, and that's true. Incidentally, I wrote in the margin, for instance, no credits. You don't, I, I, re, I realized after watching it a few times, you never even see Jane uh, Seberg, is that, is that her name? Who's the woman, Patricia? Yeah. And you never see Belmondo's name or Godard director, do you? I, I believe not. It just plunges right into, in the beginning into the stealing of the car. And there's another way it plays around with what seems, to, what Godard now. Remember, I'm trying to say that Michel is obviously somebody Godard is produ creating and he belongs in a movie that expresses the same sort of freedom and anything goes and irreverence and, and style that he does. So he says, he, he says, uh, he's done all kinds of interesting things. He says he's bringing De Gaulle and Eisenhower into the movie as an international backdrop 
Somebody says, oh, this is some critic saying, he brings De Gaulle and Eisenhower into the movie as an international backdrop to a petty, low-life drama. So he thought himself the first to drop the names of Renoir and Faulkner, the first to show Picasso the lovers, the first to play disrespectfully, be offhandedly with art. So he's doing all these, these things which the, that critic thinks he may not really have been the first, that he claimed to be the first. He claimed to be sort of breaking out of the normal, standard, serious way of doing movies. Okay, so much for Michelle. Now you get a chance to say something if you want to. Uh, anybody? Yeah. I have a question about, uh, there's this one part after, uh, uh, the, the girl was talking to Michelle and she said, I hate informers. And he said, ah, oh, informers and informers. Yes, that's very important. I'm going to come back to that lover's love and so forth. Yeah, that's, that's a kind of nihilistic poetry. That is, there's no real reason for doing anything. So inf the only informers inform means, you know, that's just what they do. And the lovers love, and I forget what else. I, 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 we're going to come back to it, but that's just the right thing for him to be saying. And he says it, according to the script, as a kind of poetry. That's why I call it nihilistic poetry. Yeah. Yes. Yes, right. Yes, Except I wish it were as clear as you said it. You did hear her? She's contrasting the, the selfish ego egoism of Michel Poitard with uh, the selflessness that Dostoevsky is recommending. It's a little trickier than that, in fact, because Nietzsche says in one of the passages I read, but I don't remember which, I couldn't jump to it, that the, the free spirits are magnanimous. And, and, and generous in their cheerfulness. So he's, he's egotistical. He goes after anything he wants, anything he desires. He doesn't care about what anybody else wants. But on the other hand, he's not exactly selfish in the sense that he, that he isn't happy to uh, somehow... Do we see it anywhere that he cares about anybody and gives anything to anybody? Yeah. The what? Drives her around. Well, I mean, of course, she's with her. He's generous because he cares about her. He gives a book of matches to the guy who asks him to light the cigarette, but that's not much. It's like an onion. Uh, but uh, what? Breakfast. What? To the girl whose money he stole. Yeah, that's probably the kind of generous. He, he really wanted to buy her breakfast with her money that he stole. Yes. Well, that's, that's, that's this weird kind of, of egoism, which is not selfish. He's not, you know, I, I, I think it's peculiar. Anything else? Okay, let's go on to Patricia. In a way, she's, if anything, more interesting, if you can find anything more interesting. The, 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 what, what's characteristic of her? Well, let's ask, you know, he's got all these definitions of himself, all these stories he tells. She's got a whole lot of occupations she presumably once had and has dropped. She's dropped one role after another. She's repudi presumably repudiated her family and country and come to Paris. She says to study at the Sorbonne, but she doesn't study anything. She says she's working on a book, but we don't see her writing any book. She wants to be a reporter. But th these are not stories, by the way, she's making up in the way that he's making them up, where he knows they're just inventing possible lives. These are sort of things that she sort of wishes she was doing, but she's just not committed enough to do any of them or carry them through. So she's working on a book, but she doesn't write any. She wants to be a reporter. She attends that important press conference, which I'll come back to, that she doesn't write it up. And the wonderful thing is her job, that, for which I guess how she supports herself, is the most uncommitted job you could possibly have in the world, selling the Herald Tribune. You just go and you get it and you pay for it and you sell it and you keep the profit. And you can pick up this job anytime. You can drop this job anytime. It doesn't require any skills or any qualifications. She has this sort of minimal identity. Now, they both have a kind of minimal identity real identity, and he makes up all these other identities, and she makes sort of all these other 
wishes, but she doesn't do anything about them. You can see already there's something negative about her identity or her, her occupations in that she doesn't, they're all, they're all repudiations of something, her country, her family. And now there's also her gender. She seems, I think, to repudiate her sexuality. She walks in this awkward, I think, unfeminine sort of way. She cuts her hair in this severe short haircut. She wears Michelle's clothes. She wears no bra. He complains about that. These are things that seemed weirder in, I don't know, 50 whatever when this movie was made. They are sort of non, uh, non doing what, but they aren't sort of doing something different exactly on it for its own sake. I don't know what they are. They're just, I see them as just sort of denial of taking on any of the role or jobs that being uh, a woman in France in 19, 60 or whenever it was, uh, requires. Uh, and then she says she's pregnant, but then she drops that issue. She certainly isn't acting on her pregnancy or seeking marriage or an abortion or planning for a baby or anything like that. It's just another thing which she sort of denies. Uh, and I guess, this is a funny one, she seems to repudiate grow, being grown up because uh, she comforts herself by hugging her teddy bear. And then I discovered looking around the room that there's, that's, she's not the only one. I mean, I know my son still has his security blanket. I was just visiting him in L.A. He's 29 now, and there it was next to his, next to his pillow, just like it's always been. Uh, he went off to school. He went off to boarding school in the East at 13, just by himself, all by himself with his security blanket. Uh, but that's, he's special. But I mean, normally... <laughs> But I mean, I don't know how many of you still have your security blanket. Anybody? Well, that's what I thought. The last time I taught it, half the class, the same half I think it was annoyed at me for already, said claimed they did. But anyway, she doesn't seem to be very grown up. She has her uh, teddy bear to hug. So what? If, um, so she's. So what is Patricia then? Not an American. Not French, not a student, not a writer, not an adult, not a woman, and so forth. Well, Michel sums it up. Do you remember what he calls her? He says, you're a Martian. And uh, meaning, meaning that she's just weird. And that, none of the, and that he likes that about her, that she's a Martian. What? Did he say she looked like one? Yeah, you look like a Martian. That's right. Okay, is that different than being one, I guess? Not much different. And in this context, I mean, I think, uh, but maybe, if so, I take it back. But she does look like a Martian, particularly in that picture of her on the escalator when she, she's lit from below. She looks very weird. And at the end of the movie, she looks very weird. But I think she's, uh, it doesn't matter what, what, what he calls her. She certainly is defined in this negative way. And she even wants to repudiate her name. Remember, she'd rather be called Ingrid than, uh, be Patricia. And I don't know how much to take seriously whether the Ingrid for her and the bogey for him is making a reference again to Casablanca. I do all the movies we see finally refer to Casablanca or is that just in my head? But the important thing is she it's interesting, when you don't want your name, that really shows you don't want your identity and it fits perfectly that she doesn't want her name. Um, uh, and she, if she wants to be Ingrid, and if that's Ingrid Bergman, she certainly doesn't devote herself to Ingrid with this kind of intensity that Michel obviously dedicates himself to Bogie. And it's important to know, I didn't know that, did you know that, that this gesture with his lips, that's, that's Bogie's gesture. And apparently, did you know that he does that in movies? I never saw that in a Bogart movie. What? Oh, really? But, but so going like this is what, is what Michel does when he looks at the picture. And he does it again, uh, well, she does it at the end. Yeah. Why, why, I don't understand why she does it at the end. Well, we got to find out why she does it. But it's important that, that it's his gesture, which I think we're supposed to think he took from Bogart. But unless anybody knows more Bogart and more movies than I do, I can't claim that I've ever seen Bogart do it. But so, but anyway, he's got this, this gesture, and, uh, and he use, and he has it when he's looking at the Bogart picture. Uh, so, more important now to the big, bigger things, she's always unhappy. 
But it's not clear why she's unhappy. But remember, Nietzsche goes on about how, why uh, people would be unhappy if the, all the values in the world that they cared about once didn't work anymore, had, had, uh, had lost their value. And somehow she's got this kind of unhappiness. She says, quote, I don't know if I'm unhappy because I'm not free or not free because I'm unhappy. That doesn't help very much. But here's a better one. She says, I'm thinking of nothing. I want to think of something, but I can't. I think that's true. Nothing matters to her. Nothing means anything to her. She'd like to care about something. And Michel can always think of something. That's his open horizon. That's his creative ability. She doesn't have an open horizon. She can only complain about the, the meaning is missing from her life and feel sorry for herself. And it scares her. No, remember, he likes nothingness. And he likes death. She sees behind his face that there's nothing. No identity, no commitments. That he, she sees really that he's an active nihilist. And for her, that's frightening. N nothingness, is, and people who live in nothingness. She says on 86, you know, you said I was afraid, Michelle. It's true. I'm afraid because I want you to love me, and then I don't know. That's going to be, that's later. Where, let's try this. Here, I'll, I'll come back to that. She says, I've watched you for 10 minutes and seen nothing. 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 And then Michelle makes the gesture, it says, with his lips and thumb. And she says, I'm sad. I'm not sad, but I'm afraid. And uh, that's, that's part of her way of being. Yeah. Ah, you're on an important thing. Someone indeed. We're going to get to that. It, it, in fact, it's the next sentence. I congratulate you. It's the, it's the part about the wild palms. They're just, with the, my next sentence was, she discusses with Michelle a passage from Faulkner. She asks, she asks whether one would choose grief or nothing. And she chooses grief. Uh, and you know, you remember Nietzsche saying that, that we've gotten so addicted to meaning that we, people would... Uh, suffer any, or do anything rather than say that nothing meant anything. And she's, she chooses grief because uh, she wants to, she would choose grief because she doesn't like meaninglessness, can't stand meaninglessness, I take it. And that's the view of a passive nihilist. Uh, Nietzsche says the, 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 these people would rather suffer than face meaninglessness. And Michel, of course, says he would choose nothing. He says, grief is a compromise. It must be all or nothing. I take that to be the same thing as live dangerously just to the end. I mean, throw yourself completely into whatever you're doing, whatever brief habit you've got. Uh, and, but in the end, you understand that they, none, none of it means anything. And death is at the bottom of it. And that's all right, too. And, uh, and he has this fantasy in which the reward is all or nothing. The fellow steals the money, takes the girl away to Italy. They support themselves by stealing cars, as in the opening scene, until finally they're caught and go to prison together. Uh, I, I, that's, that's part of his, I guess, view that you sort of follow through on whatever your, your brief habit is and your realization that it's going to finally fail, but that's all right to something like that. It's funny that they finally get caught and go to prison together. And she has no fantasies like that guiding her life from, from minute to minute. When he has this whole story that he's living out through the, through the movie, comes up every once in a while that he's going to go run off to Italy with her now that he's killed the policeman and can't live in France, and they're going to live together in steel cars until that doesn't work anymore. And now comes the part I was reading by accident. That she, her idea of freedom isn't freedom to invent something like he's got. It's this kind of negative freedom. Freedom from everything. She says on page 86, no, where was I that I just had it? Must maybe aphorism 86. That's, it's always a problem to keep them straight. 80, and if that's not it, I'll find it by going back to where I was. 
Well, that's not it either. Let's go back to what was I reading when I stumbled onto this. 86. I must be losing my way. Am I in the right book? Yeah. There's nothing on 86, and I was just reading it. What was I reading? Hmm? What was I reading when I read the wrong thing? And then, then... What page? That's a problem. Yeah, but where was that? But I haven't got anything on 86. What is going on with me? And I, and I just read it. It's clearly... Oh! I have got the wrong book. Ah, well, that explains a lot. Somebody was trying to tell me this. Okay, so here we are. The, she doesn't like risk and responsibility. Her idea of freedom is negative freedom. She says, uh, somewhere on 86, according to this, uh, I want people to leave me alone. Where is it? Now I got the page. I still don't find the quote. This is a very hard to find quote. Uh, I don't know where it's, but she does say that. I want people to leave me alone. I don't know where, why I don't see it. Well, we'll you, you, you'll see it if you look for it. Take my word for it. She certainly says that. And she says, um, and her freedom is a kind of negative freedom. Uh, she says on the 86, the one I read, uh, I want you to love me and then I don't want you to love me. Uh, I don't know. I want you not to love me anymore. I'm very independent, you know. She doesn't want ever to get even temporarily involved, in a, even in a brief habit. She wants to be totally free in the sense of negatively free. It's not, be, not free to invent anything or try out anything. It's just let people leaving her alone. I, it's funny, I'm going to look up that page. I don't know why I don't. 140? Hooray. Why do we, why, why do you think so? You got, you're right, you're right. What a brilliant thing. How did you just do that? Okay, 140, she says, I wish people would just leave me alone. I don't believe in independence. No, Michelle said, well, this is, the, this is near the end where they're having this amazing conversation walking around in the room with the clarinet quintet music in the background and they're each talking and they're not really paying much good to each other and it's kind of beautiful. She says, I, w I wish people would leave me alone and he, I don't believe in independence, but I am independent. Patricia, maybe you love me. You, you believe it and you aren't. I don't know what that means exactly. That's why I turned you in. She says, I'm superior to you, he says. And then the crucial thing, why did she turn him in? She says, now you're forced to leave. And that's, I mean, the, that's what she wants. She, she wants her independence and that requires getting rid of him. Because uh, he's hanging around with this idea that they're like Romeo and Juliet. And she has this sort of nostalgia for meaning, like Romeo and Juliet. But she doesn't, she's not... She, and, but she doesn't really want any commitments or any involvement or any responsibility. And that's because, Michelle sums it up, she's a coward. The, the, the new version, I think, says she's a chicken. I don't like that. It's, she's a lache in French. That's just plain cowardly. Um, and she's, she can't stand the idea that she would lose this negative freedom. Uh, she won't take any risks, and meaning and take and having meaning requires taking risks, or having or you can just live in a wonder world like a free spirit, and then you have to live dangerously. That's a different kind of risk. Instead of risking grief, you risk whatever happens when you steal cars and shoot policemen. And she's too weak to live dangerously. That's what it is to be a coward. And now. Uh, she does, at a certain point, admit she's really in love with him. That's interesting. I mean, there is one real kiss in the movie. You remember? Well, certainly not in the not certainly in the hotel room scene. 
where they go to bed together finally in you know, the, the series of all kinds of weird jokes. When they do sort of kiss each other, they're just rubbing noses and they're not kissing each other. And then she finds out that he killed a policeman. She sees it on the, on the news thing. And, he, and then they run and hide in a movie. And then she says, I think I must have written it here where it is. Uh, well, I jumped ahead. Well, but I'll tell you. She says, I, I love you tremendously, Michelle, or something like that. And they really kiss each other. And she can do that because now that he's killed a policeman, she knows he has to leave. And it's like Yvonne saying, you shouldn't get intimate with anybody except when they're just about to leave. And it's a, it's a way of protecting yourself. And, and she's got that. But I jumped ahead. Uh, let's see if I can catch up with myself. She, I just say I summed her up. She's cowardly, disgruntled, and apathetic. That's, she is a passive nihilist. She understands that nothing means anything, and she doesn't like that a bit. Now, so now we can go, well, no, wait, let's say what anybody wants to say about Patricia, because the next subject is how they're related to each other. That's what I jumped ahead to by accident just now. But is, are you happy with this reading of Patricia? Does anybody think I did something wrong to her? Yeah. Why does she what? Why do you think she had to ride out to get away from Well, you're we, getting ahead of the story. Although there are enough pieces around now that if you really think about it, you could figure out why she has to turn him in. Uh, but you, uh, I, every, uh, it's perfectly clear, but probably not the first time through the movie. And don't try to, you're, don't tell me. You're, I don't want to know yet. Are you going to tell me the answer why she has to turn him in? Good. Tell me something else. She thinks, I'm, you're making me go ahead of the story, but it's clear that she thinks that if she turns him in and tells him that she's turned him in, he has to run away and, and, and uh, flee and hide and go to Italy and so forth. She, she, doesn't, she doesn't want him to go to prison, which would be for life, for killing a policeman. There is no death penalty in France. And she doesn't want him to die, is what happens when he doesn't get shot by the policeman. She wants him to leave. She wants him to leave because you can't, she doesn't want to, she wants her independence, as she puts it. She doesn't want to take the risk of grief and involvement, and she's getting really involved with him. But you're, you, you guys jumped me ahead of the story, so let me go there. Uh, so why does it click for Michelle with Patricia? You might think that he would hate her. After all, he says, if you don't like France, the sea, the mountains, the big city, go fuck yourself. Getting translated, stuff it, I think, in this weird... I don't know what... Is this British? I don't know what the, the strange translations are on the, at the bottom of the movie. Um, but anyway, he, he, it looks like uh, he, uh, he just thinks that she would, she, she would be just the kind of person he couldn't stand. Um, she doesn't seem to like anything. And uh, she doesn't seem nearly as attractive as the sincere good-looking, hard-working, trusting, loving girl with a job and moral principles. Remember she says she stopped getting in the movie business because she had to sleep with too many people. For whom, and the one, that girl, very important, just though you see her briefly, she is the opposite to Patricia. And, but Michelle doesn't find her interesting. Uh, yet she's, she's the only decent moral person in the movie. But there's something really funny about her that makes her funny in the sense special about her, that makes her uninteresting to Michelle in a way that Patricia is interesting, Michelle. It's very subtle. It took me years to see it. Uh, that is, she has, when, when he's in her room, he sees this thing on her wall. Did anybody notice this? I mean, I certainly, I mean, if you did, it would be amazing. No, that, that she's got something placed on her wall. What did you, what did it say? I see, well, that, what? Pourquoi? Which means why? But she, but is it all there? Not quite. It says he says what's written there, and she says pourquoi? But I never finished it. I I I ran out of luckies. She's making it out of luckies. So she's started to ask the question 
of why the do anything, or you know, the question why finds no answer, he says in the uh, in the will to power, and that's when the bottom falls out of everything. I mean, you back to why informers inform and so forth. That has no answer. Why lovers do what they do? Why anybody does what anybody does? It has no answer. There is just no good reason for doing anything. Now, has she discovered that? Not quite. She has started to write Pourquoi, the why on the wall, but she never finished it. She hasn't sort of thought it through to actual nihilism. She thinks there are answers. She's got her job, she's got her morality, she's got, uh, uh, so, and so forth. She's still got a life in which things mean things, and she won't push the why all the way. That's an amazing little detail. I think just incredible that Godard would put such a funny thing in there. That, well, let me repeat it. She's asking the question which, if she really asked the whole question why, she would discover that the why has no answer, and she'd be in nihilism. But she hasn't asked the question. She stopped before she thought the question through. And now you can see, and that's why, uh, uh, Michelle doesn't find her interesting. The thing about Patricia is, how she got there, I don't know. But for Patricia, the why has no answer. She's in nihilism. Uh, so, and then that's, where's my, where's the will to power quotes? Oh, here they are. Okay. I think I can find it in a hurry, even though it was marked on mine. Hmm. If anybody has the will to power quotes and sees that quote. Ah, here it is. What does nihilism mean? That the highest values devaluate themselves. The aim is lacking. Why finds no answer. That, I think, is what's being planted there. Um, and so Michelle and Patricia are both not in her world, where there's still reasons for doing things. And uh, they are in the same world, the world where why has no answer. They are in the after God is dead world. And what makes them so attractive to each other is that they are both in the nihilism dimension. And that makes them different from all the people who really don't understand, the people in the marketplace who don't really understand yet that God is dead. And it, there are, it makes them, so one of these rare, it makes him a free spirit, it makes her a passive nihilist. Um, so, on the one hand, you have courage, cheerfulness, energy, and so forth. That's him. On the other hand, you have cowardice, disgruntlement, and apathy. That's her. So even joyless and lost as she is, she has more in common with Michelle than the girl still living by the old values. What he likes about Patricia is that she shares his nihilism. Even though she's the opposite reaction to it, she's more like him than anybody else in the movie. Because they're all still, they haven't really gone all the way with the, the why question. Um, so she sees, as he sees, that all seriousness doesn't make any sense anymore. That they're living in a world after the values have all been devaluated, as Nietzsche says. Uh, these other people still have jobs and marriages and uh, families and think they're important. Uh, but, all, but for Michelle and Patricia, all meaningful distinctions are leveled. Uh, so you get all these funny leveling things. The, my favorite, but you have to know French to uh, really appreciate it, they, but whatever language you know, if it has a distinction between the intimate and the formal, in French it's tu et vous, in German it's du et zi. But in any case, it's very important whether you're saying to somebody too, which you say to your children and the person, your lover, or whether you're saying the polite form. But Michelle and, and Patricia say, tu and vu are equal, they say at one point. Or another one, um, physical attraction is equal. Uh, the, in the hotel room he says, I want to make love to you because you're beautiful. And then she says, no, I'm not beautiful. And he says, okay, then, because you're ugly. Uh, it's all, it's all... It's all indifferent. It's all leveled. I mean, the, the distinctions don't count anymore. 
And now comes your, the poetry one, finally. And so, and there are no explanations because there's no answer to the why question. So, uh, why are you sad? He says, because I'm sad, she says. Why do you look at me? She says, because I look at you, he says. All events turn out to be these kind of tautologies. Uh, people's actions aren't caused by their complexes, anxieties, desires, commitments, values, religion. There's nothing behind what people do. Only people don't know it. They think they're reasons. If you ask them why they did what they did, they'll tell you why. Because it's the moral thing to do, the right thing to do, the, the thing that everybody in their family does, whatever. But there's really nothing to say about them. It's all a kind of po nihilistic poetry. And so I'm just going to read you a piece of it on 124. They go into it every once in a while. Um, she says, informing, I think, is really bad. But that she hasn't really seen her, that even she hasn't put her nihilism all the way. And he says, as if reciting a poem on 124 top, no, it's normal, informers inform, burglars burgle, lovers love, look at the Place de la Concorde, it's so beautiful. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's part of that same picture. Uh, no moral guidelines, no goals, no explanations. She sees that. Uh, what he dislikes about her is he doesn't, she doesn't enjoy it. And of course, that's the difference between the positive and negative nihilists. He enjoys the fact that nothing has any reasons and that there's no why and you can just do anything you please. But uh, she sits and, and dis disgruntled about it. Uh, she, he turns it into this kind of poetry. She just sulks and wishes she could think something positive. And finally he says to her, I don't know where it is, you do things by half measures, it destroys my morale. Uh, anybody, if anybody comes across that quote, tell me and I'll put it in my thing here. But that's the difference between, you know, living courageously just go boo, uh, just t till the end, all the way. Uh, going, and, and he wants to plunge into everything and do it all the way. He wants to plunge into his relation to her until it becomes boring if it does. And right now he doesn't think it could ever become boring. But the main thing is that he wants to uh, explore it, throw himself into it. That's his way of doing whatever he does. Now, there's this funny connection. Oh, anybody want to say anything about that? That's what I have to say about their relationship right now. It'll come back, their relationship. But the basic thing is to see, it's like the positive and negatives, I just realized, in electricity or in magnets attracting each other. They are the positive and negative of nihilism, and they attract each other. Yeah? Um, she asks him often what he means. Like, he'll say a word, and she'll ask him what. Yeah. Is she trying to find meaning in him? No, that's really just playing around with, with the French business. She doesn't really, she doesn't know French very well. She has a... Well, that's what I thought it was. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think this deep, because I don't think she's trying to find meaning in him. I think she's given up trying to find meaning in him, and that's what's the scariness that when she looks at him, she sees nothing. I think he, she knows that, and that's what makes him so attractive to her, presumably. Even though she's afraid of this nothing, at least it's the, they understand, that they live in the same world, a, a world in which... Nothing means anything. And she isn't even trying to make anything mean anything. She's just sulking and complaining that she can't think anything, she can't keep any job, she can't have any identity. Uh, it's, she's further along in nihilism than the people who uh, are still, uh, to put it in a funny Nietzsche way, who are still in the shadows of God. There's this place where he says, I don't think I told you to read it yet, that oh, after God is dead, that people still believe in his shadow, in, in, which they see in caves. It occurs to me, just to say it right now, that what, is, what would be shadows of God? Well, Kierkegaard and, ne and, and Dostoevsky are shadows of God from Nietzsche's point of view. There are people who still think that though big deal, the supreme being is gone out of their picture, there's still something left that is sacred, something which is the ultimate meaning of life. So they're still in the shadows of God, but these two people aren't. And that's what they find attractive. They have no version 
of how to get, how to have a meaningful life. There just isn't any answer to the why anymore, and they know it. Now, one more contrast. Do anybody find this quote? No, that's all right. I'll find it eventually. So what, what I thought of was an interesting contrast was he's got this egoism, which is not, which is totally unreflective. He's not sort of hung up on himself. He doesn't even think about himself. His egoism is simply to freely do and, t and take and demand and desire whatever he does. But she's got something, a different kind of egoism, which one, we, let's not call it egoism. What, when he's looking at Bogart, we see a place where she looks in to, at something with the same rapt attention as he looks at Bogart. Do you remember that? In a window of a store? She's looking at herself. And, uh, it, and it's not clear whether she's looking at her face, because I think she is at first, but then she's looking at her figure, and maybe she's thinking about whether she's pregnant or not. I don't know what, but mainly she's just, she's completely narcissistic. All she sees is herself. Remember what the Renoir painting in the, in the Ren, Renoir picture of a woman that is hanging in her uh, bedroom, in the hotel room? What does she say about that? Hmm? Yeah, does she look like, doesn't she look like me? She bought this Renoir not because she thinks this is an interesting painting or she collects uh, post-impressionist art or whatever that is. She collects it because it looks like her. So she's, she is really wrapped up in herself, but it's a kind of empty self, so she doesn't get anything out of it. Um, let's see. So the only pictures in her room, I say, other than the posters, are of herself, and she thinks of Renoir's picture as one of herself. It's a kind of empty narcissism. And uh, when, when in the hotel room, in the love scene, if you can call it that, the whatever it's seen in the hotel room, she says that when they look into each other's eyes, they don't really see each other. And later she says she sees herself in his eyes. It's again, I mean, this mirror thing that she doesn't see. And of course, there's not much to see in him, but, the, but nothing. So, but she should be happy to see the nothing in him. Uh, now, another place where she gets this expression, besides when she's looking at herself, and it turns out to be important, I think, that is when the author says that something that, that strikes her. Uh, she says something to him like, what do you want in your life? What's valuable? What's meaningful to you? I forget what her phrase is. And do you remember what he tells her? He says, I want to become immortal and then die. And then, she, then the music reaches a kind of climax and she stares into the camera in a completely stunned way. You can't tell whether she understood it you know, or didn't understand it or found it was profound or thought it was surprising. It, whatever. She, she, this, this thing really strikes her that you could become immortal and then die. And it may turn out to be important later. I claim it is. Um, and now let's see. Yeah, I call out a look of total incomprehension uh, or maybe a new idea that never struck her. But anyway, okay, so now we jump to where you all made me jump earlier. Why does Patricia finally really love Michelle? She only starts to love him when she sees he kill the cop. And then she says on 123, I love you enormously, Michelle. Uh, and that's because she's safe. Her independence is safe. She knows he's got to leave. Uh, uh, and that's okay. And then they kiss passionately in the movie. Uh, and... Is it just that, the, the, you know, she thinks, wow, isn't that heroic? He killed a cop. Think of how risky, how exciting. What a, what a life to be running around with a cop killer. Uh, it's uh, th that sort of like what happens in the movie Badlands, where she's so interested that the guy she's running around with kills somebody every day. And, uh, but that's not what's exciting to her. What's exciting to her is that he's going to leave, that he's doomed that he, uh, he, he won't hamper her negative freedom and demand commitment from her and risk and demand that she live just go, just go boo, but live uh, what is it, full all the way, uh, the way he is demanding of her. Um, she, 
That's Remember she said earlier, and I read it by mistake, I, I want you to love me and I don't want you to love me, I want my freedom. And now freedom is this negative kind of freedom. And now it looks like she's about to get the negative kind of freedom. And then she panics because he doesn't want to leave. And it looks like he's setting it up for this trip to Italy with her. And he actually is going to get the money. And he's going to get a car. And then, and then there, uh, and so that's when you get to page 140. And so she says, uh, I'm independent and that's why I turned you in. And, and she says the crucial line, now you're forced to leave. And he doesn't leave. And she says, why don't you leave, Michelle? I've slept with many men. You can't count on me. Leave, Michelle. What are you waiting for? So it's clear. Why, now we know why she informed on him. Because several, several of you ask. It's the only way to get rid of him. And she has to get rid of him the way she gets rid of everything. Because she's totally negative. And she isn't going to let herself find any meaning in that relationship. She, she's just a coward about getting involved, taking risks, living dangerously, and so forth. She just wants people to leave her alone. And she doesn't expect that he'll be killed. She doesn't expect that he'll be captured. She expects he'll leave. And he doesn't. So much for that. Any comments about that? Because now we're getting ready to understand the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Rand, we randomly find out that he's married. That's right, when she's reading the paper. And he says, oh, and notice the leveling. Remember what he says? He yeah. He yes. So we bro- you know, uh, yeah, I was married once. Uh, we broke it off. She dumped me or I dumped her. I mean, that's <laughs> they totally <laughs> leveled the whole thing. That is, and it is sort of shocking, but it's totally in keeping with his uh, way of... Uh, uh, well, with, with the kind of, um, no, no, none of the old distinctions make any difference anymore. That doesn't mean that at any given moment he's not throwing himself into something, but he certainly isn't going to try to decide whose fault it was. Notice guilt and fault and all that kind of way of thinking just doesn't enter his mind. And I think that's true of the free spirit. Guilt and, and, and whose fault it is is a, a Judeo-Christian Legacy, which which Nietzsche thinks you should get over your your cheerfulness shouldn't need it, and Nietzsche talks a lot about how being able to forget instead of forgiving. I never thought of it before. It's forgetting, which he which he proposes as as a good way to live. Uh, okay, so now we're going to do is that what happens at his death, the final scene, and why uh, we now know why she turned him in. But we don't know why he said, and I'm going to assume that it's her, that what she did was disgusting. So you can say it's disgusting as long as you're clear what it is, namely what she did. Or you can say she's disgusting, comes to the same thing that way. Okay, from the moment Michelle hears that Patricia is informed on him until his last gasp, well, the, the, real, the real title of Breathless, Obudu Souffle, is la, the last the last gasp, at one's last, well, how is it? The, oh, Buddha Sufi. I think it would be like out of breath. Like. Out of breath or one's last, oh, Buddha Sufi seems your last breath. Not necessarily that you, you're dying, but you're out of breath, right. And uh, so, uh, and he, and until his last breath, he's now going to play out a heroic role. He, he becomes bogey, I think. And that is, how does it look when, when after he gets shot? Well, he's completely in control of the situation. He's not panicking. He's not, he doesn't lose his cool. He uh, chooses to stay with Patricia. He chooses to pick up the gun. And that means he chooses to be shot because uh, as soon as he does that, the police can shoot him in self-defense. Or, and he knows that. He looks at the gun and he hesitates and he decides to pick it up. And as soon as he does, the cop ki- shot, kills him, shoots him. Now, what happens then? Well, it's just, from then on, it's one of the most amazing scenes in the movie. It just 
I just practically cry every time I see it. Uh, he runs along the crosswalk. Well, he runs along uh, the, 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 the street and bouncing off the cars. And the people come out and sort of stare at him with kind of indifference as he goes by. And then he gets, when he gets to the crosswalk, he doesn't run out into the street where he might get run over. He falls with a kind of dramatic fall with his feet up in the air. And in the crosswalk where it's safe and he won't get hit by a car. And he takes a last puff on his cigarette, and he throws it away, giving up smoking, presumably, forever. Um, and, and then, who's coming along behind him and looking completely blank but Patricia? And, he, and now, what does he do? Well, he could be angry at her for turning in, uh, but since he's been looking forward to death all his life, even practicing for it, uh, and thinks about it continually, he's not going to be annoyed at her that she's given him this nice death. Uh, he's enjoying his dramatic bogey death, and the proof that he's not annoyed at her at all is that he gives her the three grimaces at that point. That's very important. He wouldn't give her this sort of intimate signal that he's taught her if he were annoyed at her. It's their secret sign. It's their sign, I think, that they're both outside of normal seriousness. That I, that I think it's a sign, when you make, the, make faces, I think it's got to do with you don't keep a straight face. Even in the face of death, you don't keep a straight face. You don't take it seriously. You, you, you enjoy it. You take it seriously as a great moment for a performance. And that's what he does. Uh, and... And the free spirit, I wrote here, doesn't, there's nothing of which he cannot laugh. And I wrote here, not even death, but I don't remember Mitra saying that. It looks like me saying that. Let's find out. 347. Uh, no, that's the one where he confronts all earthly seriousness, all solemnity, as if it were its parody. That's true, and it is true that, that even death in its seriousness is now being turned into a sort of sort of a joke, sort of a performance. And so he makes the faces, and then what happens? What does she do? Well, she just looks at him. Well, the question is, what does he expect her to do? I mean, he's, she, what, what can she do at this point uh, if, if she loves him and really understands him? Well, the one thing she can do is in effect applaud and appreciate his last great performance. He's dying with style, and he's uh, sort of orchestrating and enjoying every minute of it. She should, if not applaud, at least smile and nod and give him some recognition and some encouragement. Uh, but that's and that would be. I mean, she should be applauding his last act of positive nihilism. But, of course, she can't do that because she doesn't understand it, so she doesn't know what to make of it, that he's dying and making these faces at her. She just stares at him, looks completely blank. And the, the fascinating thing is, at that point, passive and active nihilism see each other as the opposite ends of the spectrum of nihilism. And while they were together, they, they appreciated the fact that they shared the fact that the, the why finds no answer. Now, within this nihilism, they are totally opposed. I mean, he's doing his active nihilism thing, and the, she's the opposite end. Uh, they ha I have this great phrase, they have nothing in common with a capital N. I mean, the one thing that they have is the nothingness in common, but then within the nothingness, they have nothing in common. That's the problem. And for that reason, not because he's, being, he's been killed, he says that she's revolting or the situation is revolting and he then finally closes his own eyes I mean again he's in complete control he's performed the whole thing just as he wanted it to be performed um, and then she looks at him well then she turns to the, uh, the, the police and uh, says uh, that he means she's revolting for turning him in uh, but the police don't understand then and then she just looks with the same weird look that she looked when the author said in the interview that his ambition was to become immortal and then die. 
and you get the same full face camera, you get the same music. If you've seen it often, you get a feeling there must be some connection. Uh, and the question is, is she, is this blank look that she had with the author and she's having now the complete incomprehension of what's going on or some totally new way of looking at things? And you really don't know, but there's a, a clue that maybe she is beginning to understand become immortal and die because she picks up the bogey gesture, which bogey so passed on to Michelle and Michelle passed on to her. Maybe she understands that uh, it's a step, this gesture is a, is a kind of tribute to a certain style of life and that she's got it now. Uh, maybe she's, maybe, I mean, it, how does it end? Is that the first step toward her becoming an active nihilist? It's completely ambiguous. She just turns her back and walks away and we just don't know. Uh, anyway, that's the way it works, I think. That's what, that's what happens at the end of the movie. That's, that's, I mean, and I think by that time you see that it has to be this question of whether she's disgusting or not and why she's disgusting. Yeah. Orson Welles. Now, I don't think he's running away from death. It wouldn't fit with him saying that he thinks about it all the time. He tries it out in her lap. Uh, it's, it's just another form of nothingness, and he thrives on nothingness. And he wants to live just go boo. And, you know, again, it's the, the boot souffle, the last breath is live dangerously just to the end, and he's doing it perfectly. So now you see, I hope, why I say it's pop Nietzsche. I mean, it's certainly Nietzsche transposed into sort of comic book form or something like that. But I think the hints are all over the place that Godard knows his Nietzsche. He made another movie late, later called The Gay Science, which turned out to be very uninteresting and didn't have, and didn't have, and didn't have much to do with Nietzsche. <laughs> but, uh, so, so let me say one more thing, because I still have about five minutes. Um, it's interesting to see, and I sort of hinted at that, the way uh, in a good movie, or any work of art presumably, but a movie is clearest, uh, the, the form ought to fit the story. So Godard is playing with disorder and meaningfulness and turning it into poetry. I read you the thing, Godard says, well, now all things are possible, let's just try all things are possible in a movie. And what does that mean? Well, that means, as I said, no credits, very misleading establishing shots. Could you understand at the beginning that what was going on? You get a picture of the boats, you get a picture of him in the car, you get a picture of, of him behind the newspaper first, and then you get the boats, and then you get the car, and then you get the girl, and she's making signs, but it isn't clear that they're at him. Everything, it, there's no establishing shot where you see the car, the boat, and him, and the girl all at once, so you can see how they're related to each other. Wasn't it very confusing? I mean, it took me, certainly the first time through, I had no idea what was going on. And that's done on purpose. And uh, you, later, you get a lot of handheld camera and, and jumpiness and the camera moving around at, at, at its most extreme form. I guess Godard probably was the first to do this when he's in the travel agency. And you get this creepy thing because the, the camera does the whole full circle while, while on him. And the, so I don't know what it means. It just means good artist trying some playing around. And he's, there's this funny scene where he runs out of the, when he goes to buy a newspaper, if you see it again, he runs out of the screen in one direction and he runs back in, to the, in the next shot running in the opposite direction. I mean, mis, mismatched editing, not, not incompetence, just craziness. It's supposed to mix you up. Um, does it happen too that uh, you see him in bed and then the next cut you see him coming out of the bathroom, but you never see him going into the bathroom? That's not a well-made movie. Everything is, is purposely confused. Um, okay, one more thing. Yeah. Ah, you, you, I don't remember that, but I, it isn't a continuous dialogue. It cuts, it cuts, it cuts, 
bits of the dialogue between them and just doesn't explain why there are these blanks. Yeah, that's the same thing. And another thing which I wanted to mention, because you don't get it if you watch it with subtitles, is he really plays with you. He does it twice, once visually and one acoustically. You, you could see the visual one. He sets it all up so that you think that you're going to see Eisenhower and you see all these motorcycles going by and then you see this big fancy car going by and you want to see who's in the car, but a tree gets in the way just at that moment, and you don't see it. What, what you don't get, if you listen, which is funny, is he does this big thing on the where are the girls most beautiful. And he's saying, uh, it, it isn't in Paris, it isn't in Stockholm, it isn't in London, it isn't in New York, it's in, and then the, a police siren goes by, and you must have to listen to it a thousand times or have the script to know that it turns out to be G Geneva and Lausanne. But the point is, if you were listening, a normal viewer listening with all your might, you wouldn't hear the punchline which you, if you're a guy particularly, you want to know in what city the women are most beautiful, you don't get to find out. And that's just all the ways he plays with you. It's not a finished, rational film with all the details in their right place and where everything happens for a why. You have, you have to put it together. Like an active nihilist, you have to enjoy some kind of new freedom that you get from this disorder. And you have to make sense out of it as you please. Um, I guess that's all I want to say about that, that the, that the style sort of tries to force you into a world where there isn't an answer to the why and where if you, if you, either you come away from the movie annoyed that it's so sort of badly made and leaves all these questions unanswered, in which case you're disgusting because you're some kind of uh, old-fashioned, you, you're still under the, de uh, but you haven't recognized the death of God, or you come out of the movie thinking, wow, that's exhilarating. That's a whole new ba way of being able to make and see a movie. And that's what I think happened to you, and it's certainly what happened to me, and I hope you enjoyed it. And, okay, we're going, and back to Nietzsche next time.